Hi everyone, welcome to Shades of Red, Red Zor and its Chinese Ord. My name is Joachim Kennedy and I'm a security researcher at Intezer. On my spare time, I maintain an open source project called Go Reverse Engineering Toolkit. Hey everybody, I'm Avigail, I'm a security researcher at Intezer. I specialize in malware analysis and threat hunting. Um, and I also wrote the ELF Malware Analysis 101 guide to help beginners in the Linux malware world. Um, okay, so that's me, and let's start. As for the agenda, we will begin with a small introduction to the Linux malware, and we'll talk about the Linux market share, we will say a few words about the Linux malware threat landscape, and we will mention uh, advanced persistent threats, nation states, that used uh, Linux malware in the past. Then we will start talking about RedXor, we will provide some background uh, about the malware, we will explain the rootkit that it uses, and we will dive in into its behavior on a victim's machine. And lastly, we will uh, explain our insights about the connections between RedXor to the WinTE umbrella. Now, it's no news that uh, Linux market share in the desktop wor world is really, really low. Most of desktops nowadays run on Windows. However, um, when speaking about cloud workloads, uh, Linux is the uh, predominant operation system. Now, there are different reasons for this uh, market share distribution. I will not dive into it um, in this talk. Uh, however, this explains the fact uh, why we see so many coin miners and botnets that target Linux services. We also see ransomware, which are mainly targeted for um, uh, file storage services, such as QNAP. And uh, we also see backdoors. As for the operators behind these uh, malware, among with malicious individuals, uh, we can cluster them to cyber criminal groups such as Team TNT and to nation state. The nation state that are known to use Linux malware in the past are Russia, North Korea, and China. In Russia, we have uh, Trula, APT29, and Sophacy. In North Korea, we have uh, Lazarus, aka Hidden Cobra. And in China, we have the Black Tech Group and the Winti Umbrella. Okay, so let's talk about RedXor. When we first discovered it, we, it had only one detection in VirusToto. Um, it was uploaded from uh, Taiwan and Indonesia as a Polkit uh, daemon update. What is RedXor? First of all, RedXor is a backdoor. It has reversal capabilities, um, which are provided by a pseudo terminal, um, implemented by uh, using a Python and importing the PTY library. It has different file manipulation capabilities, such as uploading file from disk to C2, downloading file from C2 to the victim's machine, updating files, deleting files, and so on. It, ha it uses a rootkit, uh, which Joachim will explain right away. And it has reverse proxy capabilities, uh, which are based on RhinoD, which is open source. Thank you, Avi. When it comes to rootkits on Linux, there are essentially two approaches. The first approach is to use a user land based rootkit. This can be achieved by using LD preload. What LD preload allows you to do is to define a specific shared object to be loaded before it loads any other shared objects used by an application. When you've done that, you can then hook functions in shared objects to change their behavior. There is an open source project called lib process hider that does this. It allows you to hide processes, functions, and network connections from the other applications that runs in user space. Now, this approach does have some drawbacks because it doesn't handle statically linked binaries. And this is because statically linked binaries won't load these shared objects, and hence the functions are not hooked. The other approach is to use a kernel level rootkit. This can be achieved by using Linux kernel module. To compile a kernel module, the version has to match the specific version that's running on the system. This also includes the actual specific patch version. Now, there are some frameworks to make things like this easier. For example, DKMS, 
is a tool that's used to compile new modules when the kernel is updated. But it's not a favorable situation for the threat actor because the source code to the rootkit has to be available on the system so we can recompile it. The rootkit that's used by RedSor is called Adore. It's open source and it's hosted on GitHub. And the way that we can identify which rootkit is being used is to see how the malware interacts with it. Here we have a function that the malware executes to check and see if the rootkit is on the system. If we look at the source code for Adore, we see a very similar logic that happens in its client application. First, a binary, well, first a file is created, and then it's removed. And then it checks what is the current user for the process that's running. If the value returned matches a specific value, it knows that the rootkit is available. Now, when we know a little bit about the rootkit that's being used, let's take a look at the behavior of the malware. This is how RedSore behaves on a victim's machine. Upon execution, it will fork itself to a child process, and by that, it will detach itself from the shell. And this is a known evasion technique used by Linux malware. Next, uh, it will check if it runs as a root or not. And by that, it will define uh, where to create um, this uh, pocky.thumb hidden directory. If it runs as root, then uh, this directory will, will be created under the root directory, um, if not under the user's home directory. Inside this folder, it creates uh, this file, which actually functions as a mutex because it is locked by the process. And if another instance of Redxor would have run on a victim's machine, it will directly exit because it will check if this file is locked or not. Um, it will also move the binary itself under this uh, directory. And it will create persistence by init scripts under these uh, directories. This is how the script looks like. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Redxor contains a configuration file within the binary. Um, this file is encoded. And um, it contains uh, variables such as the C2 IP, the C2 port, and a password for the initial handshake, uh, we will see soon. And it also holds um, variables related to proxy. As I mentioned before, uh, Redxor has reverse proxy capabilities as well. Um, all the encoding and decoding uh, schemes are uh, via this uh, dukesor function. This is uh, our implementation in Python for this function. Uh, we used it for um, decoding the buffer. We can see that it has um, basically two inputs, uh, the buffer and the buffer length. And the buffer length is used as the XORing key. Um, and as long uh, as the for loops runs um, by the range of the buffer length, uh, the key will increment itself with the buffer length. Um, you're welcome to uh, copy this and um, check it out. All the C2 communication um, uh, will goes through this make HTTP data. This is where the uh, request is made. You can see the uh, yes sir uh, uh, login.jsp directory hard coded within the binary. Um, we can also see inside this um, the Duke source scheme. Um, all the buffer is sent encoded. And this is how um, an initial handshake looks like. Okay, we can see um, the initial post request holding the encoded PD uh, equals admin, the password. Um, and then the C2 replies with all right, again, encoded with this uh, dukes or function. Now uh, pay attention for this uh, J session attribute. It holds 0000. Um, zero which is an instruction from the C2 to uh, send system information. So we can see that the next post request sent from, um, from the malware holds the system information. And the server responses with JSON ID equals 1000, which is actually uh, ping. So from this point forward, uh, the server and the register will ping until the C2 will send a different instruction. 
uh, within this J session uh, attribute. These are all uh, the supported commands. Uh, we can see first uh, the 0000 uh, system information and a bit below that, the ping. This is mainly how um, the malware behaves. Now, let's talk about the connections uh, that we saw between RedSor to Winti Umbrella. We know that XOR DDoS and Paul Linux both are attributed to WinTI. And we saw connections uh, between RedXOR and these two malware. The first similarity is the usage of pseudo terminal. In RedXOR, it's, it is implemented with Python. Uh, and in Paul Linux, it's implemented with C. Uh, we also um, see the similarity of the usage of XML for file listing. Um, this is used in RedXOR within the directory function and in Paul Linux within the get files function. Um, these both functions um, are in charge to send the file listing to the C2. They both use XML and they also use um, same um, variables uh, such as name, path, time, size, uh, and user. Uh, Joachim, I'll give you the stage. When it comes to the rootkit, we do see some similarities to other malware that's been used by the Winti group. These malware used a different open source project called Suteruso as their base for their rootkit. Here, we see a screenshot of three functions that are used to check to see if a rootkit is available on the system. The left one comes from RedSor, which is the function that we talked about earlier. The one in the middle is from XOR DDoS, and then on the right, we have Phone Linux. These are two malware that has been attributed to the Winti group previously. What we can see in these functions is that they all are creating a file under the proc folder. It's also worth noting that the, the name that the author is given this function is identical. Now we know that RedSor is using a door while the other two is using Sutoruso. So how is this similar? Well, the actual way that this should happen for Sutoruso is not via a file. Instead, is actually using a network socket. And that's how it communicates to the rootkit. So this is actually a modification that the Winti group has done to the rootkit. There's some other interesting connections too, which is comes via the lchown function. This function is used to change the owner um, of a file to or a folder to, to a specific user or a group. And we see this call in all of these malware, these three malware, is done with a very interesting argument. Here we can see both Pwn Linux and RedSor calling the function with very large identifiers for the group and the user. These identifiers are so large that they are very likely not valid on the system. Now this call does actually make sense for RedSor's purpose because this is how it communicates with its rootkit to hide files. And in Pwn Linux, we do see this call happen in multiple locations. Here is actually a call that happened at the end of the main function. And what we can see is that the file that is asking the rootkit to hide is what will be populated in the argv in the main function, which actually would be the binary that's running. And we don't believe that this is some old code that's been left there. Because this functionality and the use of LTune exists in multiple places. Another place is part of the parsing of the code that comes back from the C2. Here, if you look in the case 13 and case 14, you see the LTune function being called. The 13 case is to hide a file, while the 14 case is to unhide the file. And this is not how Suteruso handles these operations. Instead, it's actually using ioctals that's being sent over, or in this case, the file that was created. And this case is also supported by the Pwn Linux, but it's doing that via the cases 11 uh, and 12. So it does appear that Pwn Linux does have awareness of the same rootkit that RedSor is using, even though, as far as we know, 
this combination with Red Sword and Adore has not been seen before. There are other connections too to these malware. They also use uh, some unique scheme for XORing the data that's sent over the wire. They use very similar sort of persistence mechanism and names in them. The general function flow in, in the main and other functions are the same. Um, and overall, sort of the functionality um, seems to be sort of on par between them. And this all leads down even to like the victimology for what the malware has been used against. More of these connections can be found in the paper that's accompanied with this presentation. To summarize this presentation up, um, while the majority of th attacks against Linux environments comes from financially motivated threat actors, we do see nation states also targeting uh, the Linux environment. In this presentation, we have um, highlighted a new stealthy root, um, backdoor that's using a rootkit to hide itself and how it's been connected to other malware that's also been known to be used by the Winti group. Thank you.